Hello everyone, welcome home. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we are powerless over alcohol that our lives have become unmanageable. By the way, my name is Eric and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked Him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Ten, Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. And twelve, having had a spiritual awakening, as a result of these steps, we tried to carry the message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. If you could please silence your cell phones at this time. Also, we ask that if you could please refrain from getting up and down during the speakers, but if you must, please do so quietly. If you're going to smoke, we ask you to please be away from any buildings. Please be respectful as we are guests of the church. Also, if you have any announcements, please see the group secretary. Group secretary, please raise your hand. All right, Danielle will now read the traditions. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm an alcoholic. Twelve traditions. One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority. I love in God as he may express himself in our group conscious. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse finance or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, AA, or every AA group ought uh, never be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may carry service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Ten, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Eleven, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need to always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Twelve, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all of our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Brad will now do the chips. Hi everyone, I'm Brad, I'm an alcoholic. Alright, these uh, chips here are symbolizing lengths of sobriety. And for the, uh, the newcomers, we have uh, silver chips. If you want to uh, surrender and try this way of life, we have a one day chip. One day length sobriety. Okay. We have one month. You've been sober for one month. Okay, let's try for two. Two months. You want to pick up a gold chip? Okay, three months. We have to have somebody in here who's been sober for six months. Six yeah. months. Yeah.
Okay, this purple chip is uh, for nine months of sobriety. And we have one for a year or multiple years. As Deborah has five years of sobriety. This time I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. This is Wayne B. from Chicago. Wayne Butler, alcoholic. I want to thank Matt for allowing me to speak. I think Jennifer had something to do with it. Uh, it's the first time I've been at this meeting. I, I like it. you got a lot of energy. That uh, greeting line made me nervous. <laughs> the way they greeted me would make me think they like me. <laughs> well, you can bet on that. I love AA. My sobriety date is November 8th, 1977. Uh, I turned 35 years sober yesterday. <laughs> you wrote in my head. Uh, congratulations on the five years and uh, the six months. And uh, you two that stood up as new, I want to welcome you to AA. And I'm going to ask you to do yourself a favor tonight. Uh, don't judge AA according to my presentation. <laughs> really has been good. Uh, I've been reminiscing all weekend. I'm here, you know, I, every five years I, I come to Florida and celebrate my birthday. I'm, I'm down at Madeira Beach and this year I'm staying at the Schooner Hotel for the week and uh, uh, just, I don't want to do it in Chicago, it's too cold. Uh, and, uh, you know, I lived here for a while too in, in, uh, in Florida. And uh, I love, uh, if you're new, if you, I mean, how many of you in your first year, you, would you indulge me? How many is in your first year? Isn't that something? Welcome aboard. Uh, I'll tell you something that's not real pleasant, but this could be my last year. You never know. I know lots of people that get the amount of time I've got, and they let up on the course of action called Alcoholics Anonymous, and they slip and they don't know why, because the AA gave them a good life, and that good life they allowed to pull them out of AA. And uh, they turned their back on the newcomer. They, I don't think they mean to. It's just it's a natural occurrence. And the only way I stay here is uh, to the only thing that defeats my head and my perverted instincts. Uh, because it is a perversion to have an instinct to drink when you know it will kill you. The only thing that keeps me on course is the sick newcomers that are like me when I was new. that keep me pointed in the right direction. I'd like to believe that knowledge would do it. I have a lot of knowledge. I've worked really hard to gain knowledge. <laughs> That'll confuse a newcomer. Uh, I've really enjoyed the ability to gain an understanding of what I'm afflicted with, and, and I think that's important. I'm not the kind of guy that goes on faith very long, uh, unless I'm sure. And, you know, one of the things about faith is you usually got to be sure to have faith. And uh, that's paradoxical in and of itself. Uh, I'll tell you about a paradox. I don't mean to bring a religion in here, but I, almost, I, I have to to this degree. When I was a little boy, um, you know, my dad was an alcoholic by his own word, and my mother was a professional wrestler, so they was real interesting people. <laughs> my mother was a German woman, 100% uh, German, cooked everything German, we ate everything German. My mother had tattoos from the neck down. Uh, my mother had flying eagles tattooed on each forearm. She could literally make the wings of the eagle move by flexing her bicep. Her... She was bad. <laughs> And she had a full double-breasted eagle across her back. And uh, they called my mother, a, you know, it's cool now for you ladies to have tattoos. It is, I mean, it is, it's cool. You've know, you got TV shows about it now. Uh, but I have to tell you, 55 years ago, it wasn't cool. Uh, and they called my mother a painted lady. Once. <laughs> Once. 
my mom and dad didn't go to church, but they made us three kids go to church. And, you know, my brother and sister, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what their deal was. But, you know, I can remember back when I was six, seven, eight years old, and I'd go to Mount View Free Church, and I would walk through the door, and, and Blackie, we called him Blackjack, Blackie, he, he would tussle our head, pat us on the butt, and give us a stick of Blackjack chewing gum, and he would say, sit down, shut up, keep coming back. Had no idea that was training. <laughs> and uh, I would literally, please don't, don't let this disturb you unless you wanted to. <laughs> but I would sit right underneath the crucifix because that's where I felt safe and comfortable. I didn't know that until I grew up to understand those words. But, and I went to Sunday school and, and I learned about this character named Jesus. And I fell in love with him. I did. I, I fell in love with the story. I fell in love with the drama. And at the same time, I hated my own guts. That's a paradox. You see, I'm not one who blamed God for nothing. I kind of understood that that wasn't the deal. But I couldn't explain to you why I felt at odds with myself and everybody else. I can't tell you why when I would go home and sit at the dinner table with my mother, my father, my brother, and my sister, I felt like the odd guy out and I couldn't put words to it. I couldn't understand that. I couldn't even say to my dad, geez, dad, you're a tough guy. How come I'm not a tough guy? My brother's a tough guy. Why do I feel like a wimp? I, I mean, I, I, uh, as a little kid, I, I, I started pinning poetry. I didn't know it was poetry. I just had this, I had this ability to put words on paper, and they sang to me. And I remember I, my dad came out of the bathroom one time, and he, he found one of those words on papers things they call poetry. And my dad came out, and I don't mean no disrespect to anybody in this room who has sexual preferences or different from mine. But my dad, he's that truck driver that he comes out, he likes to fist fight, he likes to shoot people. He's a tough guy. Been driving truck his whole life, you know, and driving and every, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he comes right out and he says, boy, you a faggot? Boy, you write this crap? And I thought, mm. <laughs> Just the way he said it, I knew it wasn't good. Uh, and... I didn't pen another one after that. Now, it's not, I'm not blaming my dad. I'm just reporting that I lived in a family that I was told by experts they were bad people. I don't mean no disrespect. Our book says it's okay to seek outside help. I just want to put something in perspective. I came to believe my mom and dad were bad people. I came to believe that. I want to thank you guys for straightening me out and informing me my mom and dad weren't bad people. My big book says my mom and dad were sick people. And it's not their fault. That isn't my position. <laughs> and you know what even says it in How It Works? I'm, how many of you have read How It Works a hundred times? Or more? One day I was reading How It Works and it struck me deeply. There's a part in there that says, They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way and yet I'm the first one to start judging. My own mother and father. I couldn't let it go. wouldn't let it go. And there's a line in How It Works that says those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. And I could not explain to you why for five years I came to AA and drank. I could not. And then after I got sober, unbeknownst to me, I became a would not. That is... A paradoxical uniqueness, if you will. It's unique to the disease of alcoholism. It is the one disease that goes contrary to the experts. It's a disease that goes contrary. It defies science. I didn't know that until I met you guys. I didn't know that. There's no x-ray that can detect alcoholism. It doesn't exist. There's no blood test that can detect alcoholism. It doesn't exist. And the only test that they can throw at me, I can dismiss with a lie. <laughs> How many of you had? Two. <laughs> How often do you have two? Every now and then. <laughs> and right now it's now, and in about two minutes it's going to be then. <laughs> It was important for me to drink. If you're new, I want you to know it was important for me to drink. I'm not an alcoholic that liked the taste of booze. I'm with some people today that they enjoyed the taste of booze. I did not enjoy the taste of booze. And I had to come to you to find out what it is about booze I enjoy. And I want to tell you a little story to describe it so that you really understand how, how important booze came to me. I'm in this home and I feel like the odd man out. I don't fit in. I don't belong. I'm not a part of it. What's wrong with me? And I'm eight. 
<laughs> you don't go to the dinner table and say, Dad, I'm troubled. I don't feel well. You know, Dad, I look at you and I don't feel right. What? I just didn't talk. And I had these things, I had this thing that I had to come to AA to find out about. There's a lot of clinical terminology that was exposed to me that didn't resonate with me. But when I came to AA, I heard you say that you were restless, irritable, and discontented. I came out of shoot that way. I had this nervous twitch. They call it rest, restless leg syndrome now. If they got inside my head, they diagnosed me with restless head syndrome. I was often misdiagnosed correctly. When I was in 8th grade, I want to tell you, you know, I started in school like everybody else does, kindergarten. I started biting teachers, and I didn't know why. I pulled little girls' ponytails and, and uh, got scissors and cut their ponytails off. I didn't know what was wrong with me. They, they started putting me on medication. And they figured medication would get me to quit cutting their ponytails off, but I figured it out. And uh, uh, I'm getting sent home from 3rd grade. By the time I got to 8th grade, I was, you know, by the way, I said I live in an alcoholic home. Does that explain it to you? You know, you got to remember, I'm 62 years old now. 50 years ago, they didn't understand this thing. And so I got diagnoses based on my behavior and not by the cause of it. That's still happening today, by the way. Lots of people get diagnosed because of their behavior. That isn't the problem. It's the problem that's causing that behavior. And because it's spiritual in nature, it's often misdiagnosed in me. That happened to me. Around 8th grade, they were trying to figure out what was wrong with me. This was a long time ago. And they had just came out in, in, in the late 59, early 60, 61. They came out with this new test to test people's IQ. How many of you took that IQ test back in 1960? <laughs> and, uh, well, the hands went down quick on that. <laughs> How many of you have recently taken an IQ test? I've seen there's some pretty smart people in here tonight. <laughs> I took that IQ test because they didn't have the EQ. By the way, they have a thing called the EQ test to test your e emotional quantitative. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'd do good on that one. They gave me that IQ test, and I want you to know something. If you've taken that IQ test, if you scored over 100, you're a pretty smart cookie. If you score over 120, you're pretty sharp. You're bright. You're a pretty bright light bulb. You score 150, you're Mensa material. They will pay you to sit in a room and think. Hell, we'll do that in A for free, won't we? <laughs> haven't you heard we're some of the most smartest people in the world, haven't you? You'll never hear that at Al Anon. <laughs> so I've been told. With love. You score over a 180 and they want you to stay home. You're too smart to drive your own car. I want you to know what I scored. I scored a 57. And I didn't cheat. I got diagnosed mentally retarded. I know this is Alcoholics Anonymous. I had to wear a helmet. If you have a child who's organically challenged, I don't mean no disrespect. This is just my story. And I had to ride the short bus. And I want you to know something I improved. Became leader of that class. We didn't read books. We didn't eat them. We uh, played putt-putt all day, every day. That didn't make me alcoholic. But it put a definite spin on my personalities. It mattered when I got to AA. It mattered when I got here. Because you had that mess to deal with. And uh, to, make, to make a real long story short, I wasn't ever going to drink because when I watched my dad drink brown whiskey, he got his pistol out and beat my mom or shot at her. When my mom would drink that tequila, she would get that same gun out and shoot at him. <laughs> I'm just telling you that's how my family was. I didn't know I was being abused until I came to A for crying out loud. When they were both drinking, me and my brother and sister would hide in the basement. We'd hide in a coal bin. That was back when you had no indoor plumbing. Everything was outdoors, including the outhouse. You know, I was accused of having a bed-wetting problem. I didn't have a bed-wetting problem. It was 40 degrees below zero outside. <laughs> that was my problem. 
We didn't have any mason jars, if you could get my drift. Uh, and in that class, I got bullied a lot. This is not Bullies Anonymous, but I have to mention this. I got bullied a lot. All the kids in that class got bullied a lot. If you had a helmet on, they were looking for you. They got their pleasure. The bullies get a pleasure out of beating up on people who can't defend themselves. And at that point in my life, I couldn't defend myself. I wasn't going to drink whiskey because of what I saw my dad do. I didn't drink tequila because I saw what my mom did. I didn't know about beer. I heard that wasn't even alcohol. It's just adult soda pop. And uh, this guy named Tom protected me from the bullies at school. I, just, I have to tell you this story to set up the drink. Uh, our school got these tall lockers, you know, these four-foot tall hall lockers. They got they refurbished our school. And one Friday night, these three wrestlers got three of us kids from the special class, and they locked each one of us in a hall locker on Friday night. And they didn't find us till Monday. And when I came out of that locker on Monday, I had what I had to come to A to learn about. Had a resentment. <laughs> Tom found those three wrestlers and beat the hell out of them. Tom became my instant hero. I followed Tom around like a little wounded pup. I know I don't look like that today because I'm six foot three today and I weigh 260 pounds. I'm not that wimp I was. I'm not scared like I was. But back then I was scared of everything I couldn't. It was an inexplicable calamity to me. By the time I became a senior, you know, because Tom was in the same grades, and he walked, he walked through school with me. And during the senior dance, I was the only kid from that special class that got invited to the senior dance. I have not had a drink of alcohol. Don't want nothing to do with that stuff. I see, I don't understand alcoholism, but I understand what it's doing in my home. I'm not drinking it. Give me a Pepsi Cola. Tom took me to dance. I've never been to a dance. We play putt putt. <laughs> so I'm standing up against the wall, and I'm watching all these boys and girls. They're dancing, I discover. And Tom walks up on me, and he opens his coat up. You know what he's got in his hand? He's got a brown bottle with a red, white, and blue label called Budweiser. He said, here, kid, drink this. It'll make you feel better. I'm a guzzler. Any other guzzlers? I don't bother about tasting it. I'm just drinking it. I would have drank battery acid for Tom. You hear me? I guzzled that bottle of beer down let out a big old belch and I said, Tom, that tastes terrible. I want a Pepsi-Cola. And Tom said these immortal words. That's okay, kid. Have another. You'll get used to it. <laughs> now here's what Tom meant. You see, Tom, to this very day, is a friend of mine. Tom does not understand Alcoholics Anonymous. Tom is one of those normal social drinkers. What Tom meant was the first time he drank, he, he got into his dad's booze. Drank a little bit too much, too quick, got drunk. Thought he was in the bathroom because he had to pee. He was in the bedroom. Peed in his dresser. Almost went crazy trying to flush it. His mother made him do his own laundry. And he decided he'd never do that again. And he never did that again. He became a normal social drinker. And to this very day, he still is. That's what he meant when he said, I'd get used to it. I don't have Tom's experience. I have mine. Somewhere between four and five Budweiser's, I got so good looking I couldn't stand it. <laughs> I threw away the helmet, didn't need it no more. My IQ jumped up 200 points. I looked down at the dance floor and eyeballed me a blue-eyed blonde dancing with some loser. I walked up to her and said, her, said words I had overheard someone say, Can I cut in? Because now I'm Fred Astaire. <laughs> my legs are loose and she said yes she recognized me from the retarded class so she said yes she gave me a sympathy dance is what she did <laughs> and her date came back and she started liking me is what she did and she told her date she was going to keep dancing with me and I thought yeah <laughs> we danced the rest of that night Found out later that night sex meant two people. <laughs> I didn't know that. They wasn't teaching us sex education in the special class. Because they didn't want us to have any clue about reproduction. <laughs> she ruined my sex life immediately. I've been having sex since I was 13. I thought I was good at it. 
she complicated the entire procedure. <laughs> found out she was 16, I'm 17. Also found out she got pregnant. Oh. Yeah, you think, oh. <laughs> you should have been there. <laughs> See, back then, mothers didn't let their pregnant daughters go unwed. So I either married her or die. That's what dad said. So here's the retarded kid marrying his daughter. And uh, my dad says, we better get you out of here. And we join the Navy. I found out the Navy will take anybody in 1968. There's a little conflict going on across the creek. And uh, make a long story short, I got accepted. <laughs> I don't know what that says about the Navy, but I was glad I served. <laughs> to make a long story short, I had no idea that every time I took a drink, unbeknownst to me, I was taking a drink to recreate that original effect. I didn't know that until I met you. I've been to a lot of therapy, and God bless them for trying. I've had a lot of therapy since the age of eight. It would have helped if I had the right mind. But you see, I didn't know until I met you guys that I suffer from a disease that is not clinical in nature. It's spiritual in nature. There are people that have clinical dilemma. And that clinical, delection, that clinical dilemma responds to clinical treatment. I didn't respond. As a matter of fact, I got worse. And the only time I didn't get worse is when I drank Budweiser. And a little Ripple. How many of you remember Ripple? I know most of you. If you're under the age of 45, you don't remember Ripple because they closed that chemical plant down. But they still got Thunderbird. Like a little Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill, too. That, that way, when I puke, it looks like I'm bleeding. I get sympathy. November, on October 31st, 1972, I'm sleeping in a dumpster behind Larry's Oasis. I'm out of the Navy now. I've served two tours to duty in Vietnam. I've got peculiar things going on in my head. And I can't face life on life's terms, and I don't know that. I'm in and out of therapy for what they now call PTSD, but back then, they didn't know what it was. And uh, so I'm in and out of this therapy, I'm in and out of that therapy, and I can't stop drinking. And I know I'm not addicted to alcohol, because there's times when I can drink one or two and stop. But then there's other times I drink one and I can't stop. That's inexplicable to me. I can't explain that to you. I know if I take one or two shots of heroin, it's on until it's done. I know if I start doing cocaine, it's on until it's done. Because by its very nature, that chemical is knowledgeable to me. It's addictive. So I stayed away from that stuff because I didn't want to get addicted. And yet, you put a Budweiser in my hand and I can't not drink it. I don't understand that. I had to come to you guys to find out, in the doctor's opinion, that I suffer from an allergy, an interesting allergy. It's a peculiar allergy. I have a number of allergies. Anybody else? I have a number. I'm I'm allergic to house dust. I've never been put in jail for that. (laughs) Not one time has the wind blown through my house and I went to jail. I also have another peculiar allergy. I remember when I was a kid, my mother, the German woman, loved to bake pie. Lemon meringue pie. German women were big on whipping up the meringue. Like seven feet high, for crying out loud. And it's, there's got to be a curly point for it to be perfect. And it was always tinted brown. One day I'm out in the kitchen in awe of my mother. I'm only like this tall. I'm watching my mother whip up that meringue. And on the table, there's this little, what I now know to be a five-ounce bottle. But it was a little bottle, a little harmless-looking bottle, green bottle of pure lemon juice. I didn't know that then. I saw it. I drank it. I'm a guzzler. I drank that. It was bitter. You ever drank something bitter that you don't know is bitter until you drank it? I allowed that whole bottle down. And then I went like this. And my mother turned around and looked at me. She starts laughing. And then all of a sudden, my throat shut up. I began to break out throughout my body. I got sick. They rushed me to the hospital. They saved my life. I have a deadly allergy to pure lemon juice. I want you to know something. 
I have 54 years of lemon juice sobriety. Never been to one LJ meeting. I don't have a lemon juice sponsor. I don't go to Jules and walk down the aisle to see if it talks to me. Don't got to work no steps. Sponsor nobody. That makes the allergy to alcohol interesting. Because when I drink alcohol, I do have an abnormal reaction. Here's the abnormal reaction in me if you're new. At one level, alcohol does exactly what it's biochemically indicated to do. And it's indicated to do this in every human being who drinks it. The ingestion of alcohol is supposed to do one thing and one thing only. Sedate me. It's a sedative. If you drink enough, you will pass out. Anybody will. Anybody will. When I was on the job, I arrested a number of non-alcoholics for drunk driving. They just overshot the mark and poor judgment put them behind the wheel and I removed them from it. And when they said they wouldn't do that again, I can tell you right now, I never arrested them again. And neither did anybody else because they knew they weren't ever going to do that again. But an alcoholic, though, they're just in training. They're going to figure out how to avoid where you look for them. Alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful, it says. It's the one substance, chemical, beverage, baffling about it is that if I drink it too fast, you've read about people in college that do whiskey guzzles and they die. They're not alcoholic, they're just kind of goofy. <laughs> they were trying to win some stupid contest and anybody who guzzles two fists of whiskey is at risk of death because it's toxic poison at that level. That doesn't mean they're alcoholic, it just means they shouldn't have done it. You hear me? Because an alcoholic can probably drink three <laughs> and appear to get away with it. That does happen to my body, but a strange thing I found out when I met you happens to me. Yes, booze begins to sedate my body, but it has a more powerful effect on my mind. While it is sedating my body, it's making me think I'm wonderful. <laughs> my body is reacting to alcohol, but my mind gets me up on a table and I dance naked. <laughs> and I can't even look at myself naked at home. <laughs> And I want everybody else naked to drink some more. <laughs> I'm not being dirty. I'm just staying away. See, booze isn't supposed to do that to you. I know. I've studied it. Booze ain't supposed to do that to you. That's an abnormal reaction. And only alcoholics have that reaction. Did you know that? Budweiser does something to me so profound that I am willing to endure the sedation to experience the effect. You hear me? And that almost killed me because I did not understand that. Because whoever I talked to out there, you know what they said? They backed up the Dr. Silkworth. They backed him up. Remember, even Dr. Silkworth says, that's not true, Wayne. He says it's an illusion. He said that's an illusionary effect produced by alcohol. I got news for you. Might be an illusion to the doctor. <laughs> But I looked in my mirror. I'm pretty good looking. And you give me a lick, I'll kick your butt. That's what I think. I didn't know that. I came to you and found that out. On October 31st, 1972, I'm sleeping in a dumpster behind Larry's Oasis. I'm humiliated. I weigh 146 pounds. I've got sores on my body. I smell. I smell. And that's why, I, that's why I live. When it gets too cold to stay in the dumpster, I go to the Salvation Army and sing for my meals. I can do that. I can into something I can endure the worst of humiliations until I come to AA. I can't tell you the truth. <laughs> Isn't that something? So many of us die in here because we're either a cannot or because we're a will not. And uh, by the good grace of God, uh, you know, on the... On October 31st, 1972, I, it was about a little after midnight, I guess, and I heard, I heard a knock on my dumpster lid. 
and I was home. <laughs> all alone. I could always chat up the sick girl at the bar, but by the time I got her to the front door, she woke up. <laughs> she would not come into my room, one room shed. It was on wheels. Kind of a mobile home. <laughs> I was wondering who was knocking on the lid, and I'm curious because, you know, when you live in a dumpster, you better know when the pickup man's coming. <laughs> and I intuitively knew it wasn't the pickup man. So I opened up the lid to see who's out there, and I want to tell you who's standing there looking down at me was my dad. That monster. Monster. That's how I put it. I saw what he did to us, to my mom, to anybody who came into his path. To me, he was a monster. And he was looking at me with a look in his face I didn't understand. Now I'm a man who's seen death. I know there's other people in the room who have. I've seen what human beings can do to other human beings. For whatever cause makes sense to them. My dad was looking at me with a look in his face that I didn't understand. He had gone off and joined a cult. AA. Because <laughs> that's what they said it was back then. You know, We even had hand signals. <laughs> You going over to the double A thing tonight? <laughs> he didn't tell me that. I just found out later that that's what he did. He joined AA and he was paying a 12-step call on me because he'd heard my situation. And he looked down at me and he says, Wayne, do you want to come home? And I looked around my little room. And I said, no thanks, Dad. I'm doing fine. <laughs> And in my mind, I was. Do you know, one of the deadly things about the disease of alcoholism is I can, I can accept any lower level that I find. I can make peace with it. And uh, that's why so many of us don't come in off Skid Row. We don't. I know. I've been there. We don't. Um, Clancy says it best. He walks around Skid Row and there's no conflict there. Why would they get sober? Why would they pay the price to get sober when there's no real conflict on Skid Row, and I can, I can, I can vet that. And uh, if it hadn't been for my dad coming by, I don't know if I ever would have come to AA. Because I have to tell you, in a very sad way, I'd made peace with that way of life. It was only about 2 in the morning when it would start to disturb me. Well, to make a long story short, I, I don't have time to tell you all that, but, but I ended up coming to AA, and, and I came to a meeting, and uh, I, I, I come charging through the basement doorway, and I didn't notice that the doorway was 5'10", so I'm 6'3", and I entered it on a, on a winning streak, if you know what I mean. And, uh, I hit that door header with my eyebrow, and I was on a dead run. I was like a bull in a china shop, and it knocked me off my feet, literally. I landed flat on my back, and I slid into my first meeting of alcoholics. Now. And it was a round table just near the door with six or seven old men waiting to die. I slid right between two of them. And this, this booger of a man, the most evil, God sent excuse for a human being I have ever met in my life, gets up out of his chair and stands over me. You know, stands over me, you know how they are. And looks down at me and goes just like this. And then he gives this gnarly grin. And then he scowls at me and he says, slide right in here, you big dummy. We got a wrench to fit every nut that comes in the door. And by the looks of you, it's going to have to be an adjustable wrench. I'm thinking about killing this human being. And of course his cronies, you know, those six other guys are backing him up. Yeah, Barney, yeah, get him. <laughs> I mean, Barney was 62 years old. And I found out later he's only five years sober. He got a time to sponsor me. <laughs> he had to sponsor me because he was the newest guy in the group in five years. 62. The next guy was 64, and the other five ranged in age from 68 to 84. And they said, if you want what we have. <laughs> I'm 23. No. <laughs> Thank you. No. Wouldn't mind your teeth, but other than that. He says to me, dummy. I said, my name's Wayne. He said, got it. Dummy. My name's Barney. 
I am an alcoholic. And I thought, well, I wouldn't tell many people that. <laughs> and then he says, and I'm going to be your sponsor. I've been in AA 13 seconds. I know his name and I didn't ask. I know his problem and I don't care. And now I'm adopted. And he didn't look like he had a lot. <laughs> For the next five years and five days, I rolled around A and drank before meetings, after meetings, and when I could sneak it in, I drank during meetings. There was no way I could not drink. I could not stand how I felt at any one given time. The problem with that is I didn't know that. I was responding to an inner compulsion. The disease of alcoholism isn't out here where it gets misdiagnosed. The disease of alcoholism is in here. And it doesn't come in bottles. The solution does. I didn't know that until I met you guys. And I ran around with those guys and followed them around. And they they wouldn't tell me don't drink. They would just suggest it works better if you don't. (laughs) God, I hated them. I hated them. (laughs) That happened. My name's Bob. I haven't had a drink in 34 years, one day at a time. I haven't found necessary to take a drink. Well, I did, Bob, right after you talked. I found it necessary. <laughs> you might not drink, Bob, but you make me thirsty. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> On November 7th, 1977, my sponsor says to me, Dummy? Says, yes, sir, because now I'm calling him Sir. <laughs> He says, uh, why don't you meet me at the, noon, at the noon meeting tomorrow? Come early. Why don't you come help me set up for the meeting? I said, okay. And he says, do you think you can go tonight without a drink? And I said, Barney, I can't go the rest of my life without a drink. <laughs> so he says, okay, wait a second, let's slow it down. Do you think you can go just... You no, know, he starts doing that. <laughs> think you can just go tonight without a drink. I lost my... I said, Barney... You're trying to make me say I won't drink the rest of my life. I can't. He says, can you go till midnight? And I said, well, that's manageable. (laughs) I made it till 7 a.m. I'm walking down Belgian Village in Moline. I stopped and swiped a six-pack of warm Budweiser. Walked to the noon meeting of the Moline group. I got there early because I know how he is. I got there about 9.30. And I'm sitting on the front steps of my home group drinking warm Budweiser waiting for Barney to come so I could help him set up for the meeting he got there right around 10 because he's one of those I've got three empty cans of warm Budweiser I've drank I've got three more in my lap and I am going to drink them and here comes Barney walking up on me and he doesn't even look at the beer instead he does something worse looks me right in the eye not the eyes, the eye devil himself Causing me to look at the beer. (laughs) You know, that beer tasted good till he showed up. Damn sponsors are a bunch of (laughs) buzzkills. He says to me, dummy? I said, yes, sir. Why don't you come in and help me set up for the meeting? And I said, okay, I'll be in in a minute. Because i got three more beers to drink. Bob might show up. And of course, (laughs) see, Tom, his new sponsee, another Tom... He's got a new sponsee who's now got 14 days, I know, because he tells us every day. (laughs) My name's Tom. You know, he's a bobblehead doll. (laughs) My name's Tom. I've been sober three days. (laughs) And everybody accommodates him. He claps for himself. (laughs) And on the fourth day, he says, my name's Tom. I'm an alcoholic and I have, I have four days. And then he says, and Barney's my sponsor. Now he needs to die. He's my sponsor. Well, Tom's in the group already working the four step at the coffee bar. Barney goes in he doesn't make Tom help him. Because Tom's working his dad. 
So I hid the Budweiser in the bush because now I'm in trouble. I see Tom through the window. I see him. He's not helping Barney because I'm going to. I'll kill him if he moves. I swear before God. <laughs> so I get in. I help Barney set up for the meeting. And then, of course, Barney goes up and sits down next to Tom, his new favorite. I prayed for Tom. I told Barney, God doesn't work. I prayed. And he said, yeah. And I said, Tom just won't die. <laughs> I was serious. And he says, maybe you're kind of overshooting the prayer thing. I said, okay, I'll adjust it. Next day, Barney, God ain't working. He said, what'd you pray for now? I said, I prayed for him to drink. That's not as bad. <laughs> God, I hated his guts. <laughs> and Barney's working his guts a time and a time for me. And I'm in the shoebox of AA. You know, that's that table where they put the slippers. The shoebox. The runners. The AA loafers. They don't want us talking to the newcomer because they're afraid we'll inflict them with the disease. <laughs> so as Tom is working his steps with my sponsor, the door flies open. And this guy comes flying through the front door. We figured his wife did a drive-by. <laughs> and he did a full body flop like a carp. Boom, right on the... And I saw him hit the floor. and it's a, I'm pretty quick. I saw my sponsor notice him hit the deck. And I saw Tom turn. And I thought, uh oh. Now, I've been going to meetings five years and five days. I've not one time said I'm an alcoholic. You're never getting that out of me. Because I figured it out. You say alcoholic, you join. <laughs> I figured it out. You don't have a lot of requirements, but that one's pretty close. <laughs> this guy hit the deck, and I'm at the AA shoebox. And I see Barney see him. And I immediately leapt into action. I knew if I didn't get him, Barney would. It's two against one, someone has to die. So I went and picked, we'll call him Jim, because that was his name. I pulled him up off the floor. He couldn't smell. I wasn't drunk. I'd only had three cans of beer. I was having a lucid interval. <laughs> he was so drunk he couldn't tell. I got him up off the floor. I'm holding him up. I don't know what to say to him. I got him. I don't know what to say. I ain't never done this before. So I remember what Barney said to me five years and five days ago. I said, hi, my name's Wayne B. And I'm an alcoholic. I didn't mean to say that. I just joined. I didn't like it at all. Not at all. What the hell? I said, and I'm going to be your sponsor. Because <laughs> that's what Barney said to me. Throw him under the bus. It wasn't my fault. He goes like this. <laughs> What's a sponsor? So I thought, well, I don't know. <laughs> Barney didn't clue me in on that. So I said to him what Barney said to me a thousand times. I said, shut up. <laughs> Barney heard me say I'll be his sponsor, and he immediately abandoned Tom at the, at the step working coffee bar. If I'd have known all I had to do was sponsor somebody to get Barney away from Tom, I'd have done it 14 days ago. But Barney was living running right for me after you heard me say I'll be your sponsor. And I know he's coming to poaching because I know how you are. So I let Jimmy know I now own him. I pulled him behind me and I had my mind made up I was going to snap old Barney's neck if he tried to take Jimmy away from me. I don't know if I could have. You know, when, you, when you're six foot three and you weigh 146 pounds, I want you to know something. You are too light to fight and too thin to win. Barney gets this far from my face. And he says, dummy, <laughs> talk to me like that in front of my sponsee. <laughs> <You're fast. laughs> I figured he's going to tell me I couldn't sponsor him. He says to me, he says, do you mind if I co-sponsor him? You see, Barney knew something that I was too sick and new to know. He knew that I needed him more than I needed Barney. You see, AA hadn't been a become a treatment center before that. No offense. 
He knew that I needed Jim. Jim didn't need me. I needed Jim. And so he didn't say, I'm going to sponsor him. Can I co-sponsor him? No! <laughs> no, you can't. I don't have a co-sponsor. You've been a pain in my butt for five years and five days. It's my turn. <laughs> that's not what I said. That's what I thought. <laughs> what I said was okay. <laughs> It's five till. What, do I stop now or do I have five more minutes? No, I'm really. Would I have five more minutes? Four minutes, yeah. Four minutes? Okay. So Barney says to me, he says to me and Jimmy, he says, if you two clowns expect to stay sober, then you've got to get out there and you... St- I'm not even a day sober yet. And my sponsor says, get out there and grab newcomers. Grab them, grab them, grab them. Watch what you tell someone with less than a day. I heard grab them, so I put hands on them. <laughs> me, me and Jimmy Jimmy was ahead of me by two now it had been a week he had two more than me so that's got to stop I looked at Jimmy I said Jimmy the next guy that comes through that door is mine you move you die and, and I meant I was carrying a gun at the time and he knew it I said you move you die he's mine Jimmy goes oh he's all yours and by God that door opened up and here comes this guy through the door with this this deer in the headlight look right prime property I ran out of my chair and ran up to him and all of a sudden as I was reaching out to shake his hand and welcome him into the fellowship of alcoholics my sponsor's voice went off grab him, grab him, grab him so I grabbed him by the throat and I lifted him as far up as I could and I said listen asshole if you want what I got you gotta do what I did Here's, here's what I heard. You ain't got a goddamn thing I want. Let me go. So I'd heard about let go and let God, so I let him go. Because I'm working a program here. <laughs> he had 11 years. <laughs> he was having a bad day. <laughs> One last story. You know, I haven't had a drink since then. It's been 35 years, one day at a time. A lot of ups and downs, a lot of trials and tribulations. I've got to work with a lot of drunks. I gave my life to AA. I did. It says turn your will and your life over. It doesn't say half measures. It says don't commit. I turned my will and my life over to AA. Uh, do I even need to say I've made a lot of mistakes along the way and I've tried to correct them? I know you've made a lot of mistakes along the way and tried to correct them. The last place I would expect any judgment, gossip, or character assassination would be here in Alcoholics Anonymous. Hasn't a saint walked in that door yet? And yet we live with that. I know I do. And so I forgive everybody who's ever judged me. And I hope you'll forgive me if I've ever judged you. Uh, and so it's been 35 years, and I want to tell you a little story. I've got a son who's 25 years old. He disowned me years back. He did it via Facebook. If you've never been disowned on Facebook, it's a real treat. (laughs) You see, my service level in AA that I committed myself to, I'm not excusing or blaming, I'm just saying that that I've committed myself to a certain type of service. And my son was mad at me because I was always on the road and he thought I should stay home. He got on the internet and he, he wrote me up on Facebook and he says, yeah, my son's one of those AA heroes, travels around the world preaching to other people's kids while I stay here and die. That's what he wrote. And I thought, ooh. About a month ago, five months ago, I got a, a phone call from a guy that he's on the job and he had my son in the back seat of his squad car and he thinks he owes me a favor and he says to me, what should I do with your son? I got him. You want me to let him go? And I thought about it for a minute and I remember when Barney wouldn't cut me loose and I said, no, take him to jail. I don't know what to expect, but take him to jail. And I want to tell you, I'm, I'm not sharing that with you, so you think that I think I'm a hero or had anything to do with this. I want to tell you, you had something to do with this. He was arrested the fourth weekend of the month. And it was the Saturday that you bring your committee panel into the jail. My sponsor was my sponsor for 29 years, 5 months, and 14 days. He sponsored a lot of alcoholics. One of my AA brothers was the guy who 12 stepped my son. He is now his sponsor. You see, my AA brother didn't know that that was my son. He never brought my name up. Isn't that funny how that works? And about a month ago, I got a, I got a, a mess, message from my son. He said, Dad, will you come home and take me to a meeting? And, uh, and two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I, 
I went and flew into town and went and picked my son up, and we went to we went to three meetings that weekend. And I want to tell you on Saturday night, yeah, so he's he's, uh, he's four months over now, and uh, we're sitting in a meeting on Saturday night. I just want to tell you about the miracle of AA, not the miracle of me. I'm not the miracle. I'm a recipient of the miracle, and I maintain that for my daily reprieve. I'm sitting with my son, and I know I didn't do it. I know you did. Next to him is his mother. Next to her is stepfather number one. Next to him is stepfather number two. I sponsor both of them. They wanted what I had. (laughs) Someday they'll make amends. And by the grace of God and because of you, that's just one of the that's just one of the things that God has gifted me with through you that I could not have achieved on my own. So if you're new and you're full of doubt, we know why, we understand. Perhaps you'll have enough faith in our recovery that maybe one day you'll have your own. Thanks.